Greetings and welcome to Sports 101, the sports show that brings knowledge to the game. Here at Sports 101, we like to discuss sport beyond the X's and O's, where we expand our conversation to include the history, past, present, as well as in the making. We also look at the game from a people, places, and cultural perspective. I'm your host, Jamar Hart. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at Coach underscore Hart 412 and Facebook at Jamar Hart. Make sure you get social with my show and a variety of Sports Zone Chicago's other shows. You can find us on Twitter at Sports Zone CHI, Facebook at Sports Zone Chicago, and Instagram at Sports Zone Chicago. Remember, Sports Zone Chicago is a sports talk app. You can watch and listen to my show as well as any other show and keep up with breaking sports news. But remember, if you miss something, don't worry about it. You can log in to our YouTube channel, search Sports Zone Chicago and find anything you missed, or what we really want you to do is download our app, Search Sports Zone Chicago app. That app can be found in the iTunes, Google Play, and Amazon stores. As everyone knows, this month is Women's History Month. And in honor of this month, I would like to pay homage to women trailblazers in sport. Tonight, we're going to talk about one trailblazer who was known but should get a lot more recognition. Tonight's episode is on Tony Stone, America's first professional baseball player. If you didn't know, women have a long history in American baseball, and many women's teams have existed over the years. Um, In the late 1800s, not only were there a bicycle craze, but there was a baseball craze. And um, oftentimes, again, associated with uh, leisure and uh, monetary status, um, women wanted to um, engage in a healthy form of education as well as um, physical uh, structured recreation. So they start to play baseball numbers just like the men. Um, oftentimes these teams were at women's colleges in the northeastern corridor of the United States, um, particularly in the states of New York and the New England area. Again, this is the late 1800s, and this is where a lot of the um, – elite or living and they have the means to play baseball and uh, clothing to do so remember at this time a lot of people are operating off our one or two uh, outfits uh, for their whole wardrobe so to be able to change clothes multiple times in one day is definitely a symbol of wealth and status um at this time um there was no african-american women's teams again the world was not only um racist but also very um uh, much 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 uh looked at women as a uh, negative light um not even as humans at this point um so um there was a lot of obstacles this team had to face so there was an african-american women's team in philadelphia um called the dolly vartons and they were formed in 1867 and um here's a picture of the dolly vartons you can see them i'm um, sitting outside of the church uh Again, they were a professional uh, baseball team of all women, and um, they were really good. Um, the name Dolly Varden, I know you're probably wondering where that comes from. It's a name uh, for that style of air for, for the way women dressed. It was uh, all based off a character in a Charles Dickens book. And uh, she wore a hat, a corset, a uh, bell dress, and uh, long gloves. Um, throughout history, um, in Europe, oftentimes their clothes were void of color um, due to the lack of resources and oftentimes uh, religious beliefs. If you look at the uh, Amish or the uh, Mennonite communities of Pennsylvania and Ohio, a lot of them believe that you know wearing color is not of, uh, of the Lord and they wear black and white. So at this time for women that come out of this uh, structure, and start to invoke colors into their uh, uh, dress um, like women of ethnic origins and particularly of African origin. It was sort of a bold statement so that you became known as a Dolly Varden woman if you wore this uh, outfit. Again, it was um, supposed to be sultry, trying to seduce. If uh, you want to take an image of a Dolly Varden outfit, any wild, wild, west or cowboy movie you see with the woman in the bar with the tight corset 
and the um, you know, the old school dress and the fan, that's sort of Dolly Varton. So this team was named after her because they were all women. And but why did it start in Philadelphia? Um, again, bringing up uh, religion since the early 1800s, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, particularly the two largest cities on both sides of the state, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, um, which are each by rivers, uh, Pittsburgh by the Monongahela, Allegheny, and Ohio, and uh, the Delaware River, the main river going through uh, Philadelphia. Um, they have been a center of struggle for abolition of uh, slavery. Um, and this had often increased during uh, the Civil War. Um, the reason that was is uh, the state had a large population of Quakers and Mennonites. Um, they were a religious sect. Um, they were a Christian religious sect who were against slavery, but they were also against the mixing of the races. So even though they were abolitionists, a lot of the uh, um, freed uh, enslaved Africans after the Civil War, when they got to the North, had to go to certain communities to live in because they weren't welcome um, in the uh, abolitionist, the abolitionist communities, which were often uh, religious based. So months following the war's outbreak, um, tons of free um, um, free uh, prisoners of war uh, began to pour into Philadelphia and Pennsylvania and join the Union Army um, in unmatched numbers because, you know, the, the, the war was starting to change. Uh, Frederick Douglass had made his speech and they decided uh, to allow um, uh, blacks to fight in the Civil War. If you look at this next picture coming up, it'll explain the numbers that poured into Pennsylvania as Pennsylvania is a border state. Um, if you look, you can see um, Maryland, which is directly under it, uh, West Virginia and Virginia that are directly under it, and the close proximity of North Carolina. Um, if you didn't know, West Virginia used to be a part of Virginia until John Brown's raid in Harper's Ferry, uh, which at that point, uh, West Virginia tried to abolish slavery and create their own state and separate themselves from Virginia, which was the capital of the Confederacy. So with the close pro proximity to these Southern states, there was a large influx of people pouring in into both uh, major cities. Um, the other reason is the um, access to the water um, and the Underground Railroad. A lot of people took the water all the way up to Canada. So now, instead of following the water, you will follow Interstate 77 or 95, which is basically uh, the same path. Um, at this time, even though these were northern states and they were against the abolition, they were for the abolition of slavery, um, the politics was flipped or skewed at this point. So a lot of people um, that were for uh, the abolition of slavery were Republican, as that was the party of Lincoln. And a lot of the people now you will consider um, the staunch racists were Democrats. So in the Pennsylvania State Democratic newspaper, it was called the Republican Compiler. It, de it dedicated itself to creating the illusion that black people were determined to destroy the state by coming in and stealing you know, the, the white man's job. It was his God given right to come to this country, that, that same rhetoric that we hear over and over again. So they excited uh, violence towards um, individuals um, just being um, free from bondage. Um, the state Democratic Party ran for years on a platform of preventing black people from receiving the vote. Again, most of uh, black people were Republican at that time because it was the party of Lincoln. So um, due to all this in 1866, Philadelphia created its first all black professional team and a third in the country, the Excelsior Club, which was followed by the, 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 the Pythons. Again, a lot of these names were based off of watches or different um, high class items uh, because uh, a lot of these teams were barnstorming teams um, because again, you couldn't play in a, a quote unquote major leagues at the time due to their race. So they had to barnstorm and get money instead of playing in leagues. And also leagues when in, admit a uh, all black team or a team with black players on it. So, um, there was a barber named John Lang, 
and he was a, a actually a white barber who had founded a number of black male teams and a Chinese male team throughout the 1870s. So uh, remember at this time, this is, uh, if you can think of the movie Bingo Long and the Traveling All-Stars, which is depicted uh, earlier than this, but even back in the 1870s, when the black teams weren't allowed to play, they formed barnstorming teams and they would go out and just uh, play the local uh, residents of a town and they would pick, you know, a field or make a field even at times and promoters start to get wind of this. So um, just like the traveling circus, people would bring in uh, what you would call select teams um, to cause an uproar, something they never seen before to try to emulate the, the showmanship style of Negro League baseball. So you will find barnstorming teams with um, midgets on it, um, of course, all black teams, and there was even an all Chinese team that toured uh, at a time in the 1870s. And um, he decided to form three all black women's teams again to capitalize on baseball's popularity and the rise of novelty teams. Now, two of them folded, but the one that stuck was the Black Volley Dartons, as you can see right here. Um, the Black Volley Dartons were very special because not only did they play baseball, not softball, um, but they played in corsets, long skirts. They wore long sleeves and high button shoes. So high button shoes would mean shoes with a heel on it. So just like the men of the Negro Leagues, um, they were performers as well. So they would use a more sultry approach where they'd be very uh, flirty in their movements, um, maybe bending over, um, at bat, uh, blowing kisses, licking their lips. Um, they would wear uh, makeup. And um, oftentimes, instead of their prowess on the baseball uh, diamond, um, the focus was on their appearance. And it was uh, steeped with uh, racism. Remember, this is the um, late 1800s. So the De Detroit Free Press, again, uh, we see the same newspapers coming up for African-Americans. Chicago Defender, Detroit Free Press, Pittsburgh Courier. So these is the exception of these papers that were the voice for uh, Black America um, till this day. They um, had remarks about the uh, women's gaudy attire. Remember, um, it's very uh, Puritan-based society at this time. Temperance um, is pushed. Uh, it's not very uh, what you would call... Um, fast society as you were seeing today so a lot of the stuff they did that you would think is nothing of it it was uh viewed as uh like wearing uh no bra today so they would wear uh, calico scarlet dresses trimmed in blue uh, different colors trimmed together red and yellow and um they all wore red and white peak caps so again they were showing their femininity but um, showing all the colors was just a disgrace, disgrace at this time because that was ungodly. Okay, so here's my question in all this. I'm listening to this and I'm saying, obviously when you go into a, vid, a business venture like this, like John Lang had, you must have a target, a target market. Some things never change. I don't care what the decade is. Who specifically was the target market for the black, you know, Dolly Vardens? Um, to be dressed provocatively, and if it was a society that there was a closed idea about racial mixing, who exactly was in the stands watching the games? I'm just curious. Well, a lot of times you got to remember um, in these cities such as Philadelphia, even Chicago, just like the South Side, mm -hmm. um, all these cities have an area where there's a large black population. So just like now when you find other races that come in and set up a grocery store or a nail salon, uh, Lang was doing that with owning barbershops and letting, you know, black people uh, cut hair in them. They're also saying, well, since I have some money, I'm um, just like people do now and own the NFL team. Mm -hmm. well, they can try to make a baseball team that barnstorms. And my idea is going to be all Chinese this year or do an all midget team. And then when he did all women, he obviously uh, first promoted them in the black section of uh, Philadelphia, but then when they gain notoriety, um, they start to get elsewhere. But due to racism, that kind of you know stopped because other races would not pay to see you know black women play. So it was sort of like a novelty item, you know, for black men or dock workers, and um, they would play really good baseball and they would beat men's teams. But you know they were coming to bat, you know, blowing kisses at the pitcher, 
<laughs> you know, butt out doing different stuff. Oh and, God! Early you know, twerking. Spilling bases at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Early twerking. Okay, got exactly. you. Exactly. <laughs> early is like it's a mixing between early twerking and and globe trotters, right? Yep, is that what it is? Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just curious, like, who was the audience for this? So it started out in the black community, but eventually. It kind of turned into a minstrel show, which means like mm -hmm. then it went across just outside of racial boundaries because it was now an interest. It was something interesting to see, it sounds like. It was. But again, that interest was uh, dissipated or uh, dissipated, excuse me, uh, due to the racial tensions at the time where if you were white, you couldn't be seen at that type of event because you would get ostracized by your own community. and you most likely would be a threat of violence to that, you know, black community, because just like in Chicago with the, the red massacres in the summer, a lot of things were happening to individuals of African descent at this time. Okay. All right. All right. So again, uh, that's uh, my, my sensei, Maya Kai, uh, who's helped me out on the sports zone, Chicago journey. Um, tune into her show, Sean and Maya in the morning. It is definitely amazing. Um, I would love to see them go up against uh, Undisputed or uh, First Take. But um, getting back to uh, our segment, again, this is the Victorian era in the United States. So um, you see a lot of people wearing the long gloves because they don't want to get, uh, you know, colored or dark. Um, they're wearing uh, light clothes or so anything against that is considered um, just like uh, secular or listening to uh, secular music now. But um and that was in a European community. However, in our community, we've always embraced color because it was a part of, you know, your style and individually. And, you know, it definitely makes our skin tones look a little brighter. So I'm just showing you a contrast between two communities. Um, however, due to this racism, the crowds were not large enough for Lane to continue organizing the teams. And definitely as a group of black women in the 1880s, it was not as profitable as you assumed it would be. Um, after men saw them a few times and, you know, they realized nothing was going, they were just were playing baseball. It kind of stopped. Uh, women were shunned from playing sports often at this time. And um, again, there was deep racism um, in the country, so they couldn't cross over and play for women or men of other ethnic groups because as you see, Philadelphia is a melting pot of different cultures. I'm um, going in, in those different neighborhoods would be a, a, a threat to their lives. Um, the team disbanded in 1883 due to lack of sales and racism. And even though they only played a year, um, it was great to have a, a professional women's team at that time. Um, before the show started, me and Maya were talking about Monet Davis and how um, when she was making her run in the Little League World Series, we didn't hear about these uh, women. Oftentimes we hear about, um, and, and due to the movie A League of Our Own, about the All-American Women's League. But at that time, uh, black women couldn't play in that league, and that league was all about um, show and fashion, things that um, our um, honored uh, uh, guest that I'm presenting, um, would not be a part of. She wouldn't play in a skirt. She wouldn't uh, do the things that they did. She was a baseball player. And uh, secondly, that league, um, it was sort of like modeling. You had to look a certain way to play in that league. Um, so um, it was essentially for the, the cutest and the most athletic uh, European women at the time. So um, again, uh, these uh, Dolly, uh, this team that uh, based out of Philadelphia, should be given a ton of credit for what they did in the 1890s. Um, we're going to take a quick break, and when we're going to come back, we're going to continue to talk about our featured uh, guest that I'm presenting today, Tony Stone, who uh, took on the mantle of this team and became the first professional baseball player in the United States. So again, I'm Jamar Hart with Sports 101, and we're going to come right back and talk about Tony Stone. Look forward to seeing you.
Compassion, noun, sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. We're all born with it, it's in us. Don't believe me? When you hear a baby cry, something pulls at you. You want to ease that pain. You want to soothe that hurt. No one had to teach you that. It's called compassion and it's in you. However, at some point you turned it off when it came to me. 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 The cries of my soul have gone unheard, but today, you will hear me. My heart has wailed a melody loud enough to shatter your ears and you ignored me, but this week, you will hear me. This body has beat the drums of anguish, only to be silenced, but this month, you will hear me. This year, this decade, this century, I will be heard. And you. And you will be the one to hear me. And when I am finally heard. Show compassion. Show compassion. Show compassion. Remember. It's in you. When Toni Stone joined the Negro League's Indianapolis Clowns, she made one thing clear. She refused to play in a skirt. In 1953, Stone became the first woman to regularly play professional men's baseball, replacing Hammer and Hank Aaron at second base. Stone joined her first all-male barnstorming team at age 16. By 19, she was already playing black baseball full-time. Initially, Stone jumped from one Midwestern team to another, but she soon made semi-pro appearances for black teams in the West and South. Following the integration of Major League Baseball, the Negro League struggled to generate interest and keep talented players. So Indianapolis owner Sid Pollock had Stone replace Aaron, both because Pollock thought she was talented, but also because she could draw crowds. Newspapers noted Stone's sex and sometimes commented on her waist and bust size. She usually dressed in the umpire's room to avoid changing with her teammates. But her on-field talent spoke for itself. Tony Stone just kept on playing. Welcome back. I'm Jamar Hart, and this is Sports 101, the sports show that brings knowledge to the game. Remember, at Sports 101, we like to discuss sports beyond the X's and O's and talk about the game from a people, places, and cultural perspective. We also look at sport through the lens of history in the past, present, as well as in the making. Make sure you get social with my show and Sports Zone Chicago's litany of other shows by following us on Twitter at Sports Zone CHI. Facebook at Sports Zone Chicago, and Instagram at Sports Zone Chicago. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, search Sports Zone Chicago, but most importantly, download the Sports Zone Chicago app. The Sports Zone Chicago app can be found on the iTunes, Google Play, and Amazon stores. If you saw the video, you know where again we're talking about Tony Stone right here. Tony Stone was an amazing baseball player, and um Again, she was the first uh, professional baseball player and the first woman to play uh, baseball um, professionally as well. Um, Stone was born July 17th, 1921, as Marcinia Lye Stone in Bluefield, West Virginia. Um, when we talk about um, geography, especially um, at this time, West Virginia was a major stop on the Underground Railroad, again, going up Interstate 77 and 79. Um, it's close proximity to Pittsburgh, allowed people to go follow uh, the rivers uh, to uh, Canada and had uh, quite a few pockets of large black populations. Um, currently in Bluefield, West Virginia is one of the largest uh, populations in the state of West Virginia with 12 percent uh, African descent. Um, first, she was the first of three women to play professional baseball full-time for the Indianapolis Clowns in the previously all-male Negro Leagues. 
Um, she went on to play. Um, she played barnstorming for a while, and we'll get into that. Uh, for the San Francisco Sea Lions, that was one of her first teams that she played for professionally. That was a barnstorming team in San Francisco. She then moved to the New Orleans Creoles. Um, that team was a barnstorming team, and they would base uh, their identity off of, quote, unquote, being Creole. Oftentimes, the people weren't. They were just light-skinned, so they would assume a moniker. And um, she went down to play for them as well as the novelty as a woman playing professional baseball. And her most famous stint with the Indianapolis Clowns of the National Negro League and Kansas City Monarchs. Um, she retired after her two years with the Clowns and Monarchs and in 1954 after a, a career of playing baseball. Um, so Tony, she came from a two-parent household, which was uh, quite uh, the norm at that time, regardless of what people say right now. Um, uh, until the 1960s and 70s, uh, the marriage rate was uh, on par, if not higher, than all other ethnic groups in the United States. So um, at this time, again, she grew up with two parents. Her father was from Alabama, was a graduate of Booker T. Washington's at Tuskegee Institute. Um, being from Alabama and a graduate, he decided he would move for better opportunities and obviously for a less lack of being killed. So he moved to Bluefield, West Virginia to start a, a barber shop. Um, he left briefly to serve the army in World War I. And uh, when he came back, when Tony was around 10 years old, they moved the family to the Rondo neighborhood of St. Paul, Minnesota. So if you ever been to Minnesota, um, I went there a few times when I was at Iowa. Uh, you have Minneapolis and then across the uh, bridge is uh, St. Paul, henceforth the name of the Twin Cities. But there is a, a stark difference in both two. So St. Paul looks a lot more urban than Minneapolis in regards to the buildings, the infrastructure and the medium incomes versus uh, Minneapolis. So they moved across the bridge, which is a term they use uh, to St. Paul and started Boykin's Barber and Beauty Shop. Um, they were entrepreneurs at the time, again, coming from Tuskegee Institute and being students of uh, Booker T. Washington. So his mother uh, was a beautician and his father was a, a barber with a college degree. Um, Tony's mother worried so much that baseball was not ladylike. Uh, again, often people called her tomboy. And again, at this time, uh, attitudes towards women playing sport weren't as liberal as they are today. Uh, women were supposed to be domesticated and working to clean the home for when their hardworking man got home and give him a plate and give him love and affection, not outside uh, perfecting their craft at sport. Um, so her mother really thought that baseball was just too boyish or mannish. So she bought her a pair of figure skates and Tony started to uh, figure skate. So despite in Philadelphia on the, um, in the black areas where they would uh, um, have the figure skating contests that she can compete in, um, she won citywide competitions, but yet her interest stayed with baseball because that was her one true love. Um, at school, she was often ridiculed because she wore pants instead of skirts and was teased for this preference. And many times she skipped school to play baseball. Um, later on, these pants or bloomers, or what they were called, um, invented after a, a lady by the last name of Bloomer, became a symbol of the women's rights movement as a movement saying uh, we can wear pants too, or dungarees is another name they would call them. Um, in regards to Tony's schoolwork, it was not that she was dumb. She was very bright. Um, oftentimes as a child, um, her parents would catch her reading the Chicago Defender. Again, even though she was in uh, the Twin Cities of uh, uh, Minnesota, um, the Chicago Defender was the top, uh, you know, one of the top newspapers at that time for African-Americans. And the close proximity to Chicago allowed them to get copies of the Defender. Um, so she will often read that instead of going to school. And what she said was that the content that, that was taught in school was not reflective of her reality as an African in America or African American. So what basically she was saying was, you got to remember at this time, the school books are not what they are today. Um, Egypt is not in Africa. Um, it's in Mesopotamia. Um, a lot of things that were true were left out 
to discredit um, people of African and other culture um, um, communities. And with these being put in, um, now children get a greater sense of worth uh, when they learn these things, with, with these things lacking and being in a racist time, a lot of black students chose not to go to school because, you know, why would you want the teacher to talk down on you and, you know, say things you're just going to grow up to be, you know, uh, someone's housemaid, you know, et cetera, to wash clothes, things like that, especially, you know, if you're an athlete. Um, so her mom took her to a Catholic priest for help because um, they tried to pray the athleticism out of her. Again, this was devilish for um, girls that like sports so much at this time. However, the priest recognized uh, Tony's strengths as a pitcher. She had a strong arm at the time, and he encouraged her to try out for the uh, Claver Catholic Church boys baseball team in the midget league. Um, now they call that Little League Baseball. So before Monet Davis, Tony Stone was playing uh, Little League Baseball with boys and doing well. So at 16 years old, um, she was playing weekend games, barnstorming with the Twin City Colored Giants. Again, uh, that's a team that was based out of Minneapolis, St. Paul, and they were barnstorm that area. Um, yet a Negro League wasn't formed at the time, so whatever teams they can get, they would just hop in their car and try to find games. At uh, this time, at 16 years old, she was getting paid uh, 2 to $3 a game, so her parents let her play. That was very good income back then, especially for uh, a young lady. So she eventually dropped out of high school and decided she wanted to make a living playing professional baseball. In 1943, Tony moved to San Francisco where her sister lived. Um, so she uh, made a living uh, uh, taking odd jobs and she lived in the, the black district of San Francisco at the time, the Fillmore district. And this is when she took the name Tony Stone um, like most people, when they move to California, they want to reinvent themselves uh, for Hollywood. And baseball was Hollywood at the time, and particularly black baseball. So she figured Tony Stone would be a better name than Marcinia. Um, so she was going to the, uh, a, a local bar in the uh, Fillmore district, and she was introduced um, to someone that got her to play American Legion baseball. So American Legion baseball is for... Um, athletes that just graduated high school or right before college. So it's usually 17 uh, to 19. Um, again, knowing these limits in San Francisco, um, she took 10 years off her age and just told people she was 17, but she was really 27. Remember, she grew up, she was born in West Virginia, then moved to Minnesota and barnstormed there, and then eventually made her way to San Francisco. Um, so um, she talked and talked and talked to just baseball promoters trying to get on the circuit. And she finally was on to be able to the barnstorm with the San Francisco Sea Lions in the spring of 1949. And the reason she got this opportunity, she told the promoters she could um, draw crowds. Remember, um, similar to minor league uh, baseball or any minor league sport at the time, the Negro Leagues were great in their production of entertainment in between innings as well as the game. Most people talk about the spectacle that they would use on the field, such as infielders uh, playing real tight so the ball will come at them fast and they can do tricks before throwing the first base. Um, the outfielders playing short so they can show their speed and run down balls, um, dancing, um, just doing things like that on the field. But no one talks about the genius of these owners and promoters with their um, off the field or between any entertainment, which is a staple for basketball and minor league sports at the time. So uh, in between innings, you would see, um, you might see uh, a baby race, you might see two midgets boxing, um, you might see some uh, people uh, wrestling, um, no telling uh, what you would see. But again, this was the example of the modern day entertainment um, so at the first game that she was able to play for the Sea Lions after drawing a crowd, she batted in two runs her first time up. So that's pretty good to get two RBIs your first time at bat in a, a professional game. Um, soon after this, um, she moved to New Orleans and joined the New Orleans Creoles. And she played for them between 1949 and 1952. But she decided to quit because she found out she was getting paid less than the men. 
and they were all out there performing the same job, uh, working the same hours. And actually, she had to face more oppression due to the standards they had at that time, not only for black people, what is even worse for black women in, in regards to the treatment they had to face. So in 1953, um, she signed with the Indianapolis Clowns and they were owned by Sid Pollock and she was signed to, uh, to play second base. The reason she was signed to play second base because the Clowns had lost their previous second baseman to the Milwaukee Braves who later moved to Atlanta and his name was Hank Aaron. At uh, this time, she signed for around $300 a week, but for the novelty, they had to tell people that she was the highest paid athlete ever. So if you look at articles in the Defender, the Detroit Free Press, the Pittsburgh Courier, you'll see $12,000 a week and just various amounts to get people to come to the game to see how good she is. Um, there was other reports that Pollock wanted uh, Stone to play in a skirt or short similar to if you watch the movie A League of Their Own, which detailed the All-American Women's Baseball League, and she refused because, again, she was a ball player. She wasn't um, uh, there to, to cause that, um, even though she did wear a foam rubber chest protector. And oftentimes, as um, the video stated, um, people would talk about, again, she's a woman and she's fit because she's playing baseball all the time. So they would talk about her figure um, her, her breasts, her curves, um, while she was playing baseball, which would diminish her actual greatness of playing baseball. Second base um, in the Negro National Leagues were at their heyday for the top team. That's highly impressive. Okay, I want to like back this up a bit because you said something to me that had to be indicative of how good she had to be. Mm -hmm. She replaced Hank Aaron. Now, mm -hmm. mind you, you can't tell me. We know. Um, I don't. People might say you're being biased, but I, I think there's clearly the thought that Negro League Baseball was amazing. It was very mm -hmm. talented, um, and, and finally MLB is going to acknowledge those numbers. So it'll be curious to see when we start to kind of match those things up. How many more names will come out besides the likes of you know Josh Gibson, who clearly mm -hmm. deserves more accolades than what he has. Definitely. But you can't tell me there wasn't a man available that couldn't have stepped into that role. You're talking about a woman replaced Hank Aaron and people might say it was just the Negro Leagues, mm -hmm. but that just goes to show you that she must have had a consistent work ethic and a skill level that was an ex was exceptional mm -hmm. to be able to move among these teams and to command the kind of money that she was making specifically as a woman. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely um, her speed, her, her hand-eye coordination uh, was on another level. Remember at this time, the Negro Leagues, especially the teams in Chicago, uh, Pittsburgh, New York, um, they were beating Major League Baseball teams and their All-Stars uh, combined. So this was actually a better league. And then the, with the style of play that they played, with the infielders playing so close, you got to move faster because the ball is – the reaction time is such faster because you're closer. Um, being able to have an arm to do the things like – if the ball's hitting the outfield, the second baseman will run in center field and catch it. The shoulder speed, different things that they did. Not only you have to be an athlete, you had to be an entertainer. So she was, she was versed at both, just like everyone else that played in the Negro Leagues. Um, I'm curious in in the Negro League Museum, museum if there's any kind of notation about her. Um, I just think it's a very unique situation to have someone who had such a, had longevity. We're not mm -hmm. talking about like she was like a flash in the pan. Mm -hmm. I mean, she moved around the country. She was able to navigate and to get on teams. And trust me, it would have been very easy for her to not have been able mm -hmm. to achieve the things that she did. So I'd be curious if there's any real notation about her in that museum. I hope there is. And if there's not, mm -hmm. there absolutely needs to be. I definitely agree with you, Maya. And one thing that people will say is a lot of people discredit the barnstorming teams. As you know, there was two professional leagues. There was two Negro national leagues. Mm -hmm. And uh, most people call those teams the true professional teams. However, everyone that if you're getting paid two or three dollars at the time where most people don't make that in a day, uh, you're a professional. And being a woman, um, she got married and uh, left her husband to go play baseball. So she was highly dedicated uh, uh, to the sport, and had to go through a lot of adverse situations before she got to her two years she spent with the Indianapolis Clowns 
and the Kansas City Monarchs, who was uh, Jackie Robinson's former team. You know, and it's interesting because I'd be curious in her story, because now I have to dig into this deeper, mm -hmm. is that, one, how accepted was she in the respective Black communities where she played? Um, she was clearly, like, stepping outside the role. Um, we know, especially within Black culture and the, during those times, um, it was always difficult for men to find work. It was limitations mm -hmm. to what they had for a long time. So to already have her step out of what would have been considered to be a traditional gender role and to do something that clearly would have thought to be for men, I'd be really curious to how much she was embraced in respective communities where she played. And I have to say, $300 a week is pretty damn impressive for back mm -hmm. in the day. I mean, mm -hmm. she actually amassed a good amount of wealth considering what she was doing for a living. Exactly. And to answer your question, uh, oftentimes her teammates, you know, as men, they would uh, be kind of closed off. But then once, you know, they got to know her, she would become part of because not only were they baseball players they were entertainers so they had to do skits and, and shows together um the owner of the clowns was best friends with the owner of the harlem globetrotters so they often collaborated on different things to do um he was taking the basketball arena and they wanted to transform or transpose that to the baseball diamond hmm okay very interesting okay when you listen to Sports 101 and Tamara Harp, you always learn something new. I knew nothing about this. I think this is so sad that it flew under the radar. For all the talk we hear about the Negro Leagues, how could this narrative be left out? Um, so what perfect that we bring this to the light during Women's History Month. Is this exactly. And uh, the, one of the reasons I did it, when I was at Iowa, they always talked about Babe Dietrichson. And um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. her, her um, Tony Stone's exploits far exceed Babe Dietrichson. And I never heard from her there. So when I was searching for uh, women in sports, when we talked uh, last week, I, I saw this and I said, I have to do this because she embodies, you know, the African-American spirit and then the women's spirit as well, too. I mean, when you think about it, it's boundary breaking. The fact that she was playing a sport, um, she was literally like on her own. It wasn't mm -hmm. like she had another female on the team. She was, to me, she broke so many boundaries in what she did. And it's something that should be more frequently talked about because mm -hmm. we're talking about a time when it was difficult to step outside of a gender role. And, yeah. she, and she did, but she also had success with it. So it's amazing that her story is not really talked about. And again, her, her political stances as well, um, you could kind of compare it to Colin Kaepernick because taking a stance where before all the women had to wear skirts and be flirty, even in the uh, teens depicted in the league of their own, which mm -hmm. is Ed West, they promoted that. But she, I'm wearing pants like everybody else. I'm a baseball player. And she told them no to that uh, several times because they would say, if you dress like this, even more people will come because they want to see your curves and your figure. And you know, she opposed that. And that was uh, great because a lot of black athletes now, uh, if you look at the example of Dallas Cowboys and Jerry Jones, a lot of people acquiesce when the management asks you to do something. And she didn't in the, in the early 1900s. And she got away with it. Interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So again, when we talk about Pollock, as I stated, um, he was a partner in several business ventures with Abe Saperstein. Saperstein was the owner of the Harlem Globetrotters, and he also was one of the co-founders of the West Coast Negro Baseball Association. So the Negro National League obviously was more East Coast, and then you had teams in Chicago and Kansas City, but there was no teams on the West Coast. So they tried to duplicate that, but again, due to the lack of numbers, um, Chicago, Kansas City, um, these teams on the East Coast had uh, large populations uh, or cities with large populations of individuals of African descent so they can make money by having games. But in California, it was so spread out and in particularly other states on the West Coast, the league, the league never materialized. So, again, similar to the trick basketball team, the clowns both provided clown style entertainment at games and they also played serious baseball. So they lived up to their uh, moniker as the Indianapolis Clowns, but again, uh, similar to the Harlem Globetrotters, whose owner was uh, friends of the Clowns owner, they wanted to emulate uh, entertainment on the field. So they would do different things, as I previously stated, to entertain you while playing baseball. Um, so in her first season with the Clowns, she played 50 games, 
and batted 243. So that's not really bad for a second baseman. If you know anything about baseball, uh, most times uh, your second baseman is you bat at the top or the bottom of the order. Your job is to get on base and use their speed to advance uh, through the bases. I small ball, which is a concept that was developed in the Negro Leagues. So her 243 and ability to get on base was not all-star level, but was very great at the time. Again, the Negro Leagues was better than Major League Baseball at the time and produced a lot of Hall of Famers that are now being recognized by Major League Baseball. Um, the newspapers at the time claimed that the attendance at Clowns games hit record levels when she started playing and she was heavily featured in promotional materials. So if you look right here, um, you'll see some uh, promotional uh, pictures of Tony Stone and how they featured her. So again, this is a woman featured in Negro uh, and, and professional baseball in the 1900s. So oftentimes uh, in our community, we talk about liberation and uh, women's rights and feminism and a lot of my professors would, when we discussed it, would say that is not a, a, a issue in, in the, the African American or African Afro Latino community because all those communities were matriarchal from the beginning. Big Mama was always featured. The woman was never put down, even in uh, uh, religion or spirituality. If there was a male deity, there was a female deity. So you can see in Negro League Baseball, woman is being featured on the front page of uh, flyers and handouts in the 1900s when other races, women were not featured in that. So that's something for, you know, black women to think of before you, you know, we jump into other people's uh, fights and uh, battles. Um, oftentimes she will have many, like I stated before, she had a, a lot, a lot of opposition, not only while she was barnstorming, but when she did play in the Negro National Leagues, being the only woman on the, woman on the team, obviously she could not change with the men and um, uh, due to biology, which does not make her weaker, um, needed def different uh, bathroom facilities. Um, so at this time with the, the Negro Leagues, the bathrooms were sometimes non-existent for the men. So the men will have to sleep on the bus or you know go to a gas station and wash up because of the racism. So as a black woman, it was a uh, double hard on her because she couldn't shower with the men. So some games or most games that she started, she would leave in the between the fifth and the seventh inning so she could shower before the team came off the field. So, and the reason she had to do this is because again, these are rickety uh, um, type uh, stadiums they're playing in. So it might not be hot water. It might be hot water for a few moments. So she can take a shower, let the water pressure build up, and it can be hot for the rest of the team. And she can get clean and comfortable after playing baseball so they can get back on a bus and go to the next uh, city. Uh, she never had a locker room to dress in. Again, at this time, um, the men didn't have great accommodations, so hers were worse. And oftentimes, she was sneaking the umpire room before games to dress. Um, she was traded to the Kansas City Monarchs after her season with the Indianapolis Clowns and uh, decided to retire in uh, 1954. Um, so she finished her career again with a batting average of 243, which was even if uh, she was a man would have been great. And uh, Tony Stone was inducted into the Women's Sports uh, Foundation International uh, Hall of Fame in Long Island, New York. And in 1990, her hometown was well, not her hometown because she was born in West Virginia, but uh, where she spent most of her uh, uh, child uh, um her child uh hood years in St. Paul, Minnesota, um declared March 6th as Tony Stone Day. And then also in St. Paul, um, again, which is baseball crazy, um, uh, not in Minneapolis, but across the bridge in St. Paul, she has a field dedicated to her, the Tony Stone field that was dedicated in 1996. Um, she took care of her husband and he died when he was 103. And in 1996, um, at the time I dedicated the field, um, unfortunately, she transitioned to the realm of the ancestors and uh, transitioned due to uh, physical heart failure. 
Um, she uh, died in Oakland, California. She always loved the water, and that's one of the main reasons she moved to California. Um, at that time, people, it was uh, Penny Saver Magazine, Sears, catalogs, and, um, you know, leaflets. So if you got a leaflet about uh, the water, she will often save those. And when she got to California, decided she didn't want to leave. Um, and final thoughts, again, this is Women's History Month. So in this way, we definitely have to honor women and also acknowledge their trailblazing um, exploits in the field of sports. And especially since they came before us, oftentimes this generation, which is a microwave generation, if you can't pull it up on Instagram or YouTube or Twitter, it's not the truth. However, nothing's new underneath the sun. So by researching what's in the past, you can learn and improve your future. Um, Tony Stone defied her time playing in the most decorated baseball league of its time. Again, the Negro National Leagues are just getting its due today, but they were better than Major League Baseball. And again, she was a trailblazer, not only uh, uh, for women, but uh, for African-Americans in general, because everyone in this league had to fight the oppression of major league baseball. So these games they played against their major league uh, all-stars or against certain teams um, were highly um, uh, sought after to get a victory because it was uh, proven that, you know, you were worthy. Um, so the question I would like to leave everyone with is what would the next generation do to inspire as Tony Stone did? Uh, where there'll be a cheerleader in Frisco, Texas, um, that uh, inspires some new cheerleading um, uh, moves uh, when she gets to high school or college. Or there'll be a gymnast such as uh, Simone Biles or the young ladies at UCLA that revitalizes uh, gymnastics. Or it'll be a soccer player that comes on the scene and takes U.S. soccer to the next level. Who knows? But we must encourage our women to participate in sports because athletes are athletes and our women deserve the right, need the right um, to participate in these sports just as well as our men do. This is Sports 101. Thank you for your time. And uh, be sure to follow me on Twitter at Coach underscore Hart 412. Also, make sure you get social with Sports 101 and a litany of other shows on Sports Zone Chicago by following us on Twitter at SportsZone CHI, Facebook at SportsZone Chicago, and Instagram at SportsZone Chicago. Remember, subscribe to the YouTube channel, search SportsZone Chicago, but more importantly, you download the SportsZone Chicago app. SportsZone Chicago is the only Black-owned sports podcast in America, and we want to take this nationwide. And we only can do that with your support. The SportsZone Chicago app can be found in the iTunes Google Play, and Amazon stores. Again, I am Jamar Harp, and thank you for joining me in another episode of Sports 101. I will see you next week on our regular scheduled time, Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Central and 9 p.m. Eastern Standard. Have a blessed evening. You see me, you hear me, respect me. Respect, do regard for the feelings, wishes, rights, or traditions of others. We don't have to agree, but I deserve to be heard. I stand my ground, respect me. We don't have to be friends, but I deserve your civility. I stand my ground. Respect me. You don't have to understand my culture, but I deserve to be authentically myself. I stand my ground. Respect me. I stand in defiance of your need to make me less in order for you to feel adequate. I stand. I stand aware that the America that you see and love today 
is a result of my free labor. I stand. I stand knowing that the contempt you have for me was not instigated by me, but perpetuated by the fear you have of me. I stand. I stand surviving your many attempts to emasculate me. Indeed, I thrive despite it. I stand realizing that you take many things from me, but I will not allow you to take my respect. I am a man. I am a proud man. I am a proud black man. I am authentically, undisputedly, unapologetically a proud black man. I am authentically, undisputedly, unapologetically a proud black man. I am authentically, undisputedly, unapologetically a proud black man. Respect me. I have done more than enough to deserve it. And still you would hold it. The bill is past due. You owe me. Respect me. Respect me. Respect me.